Thank you, Lord. You're so yes, good Lord. to us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. You're the great I am. Yes, You're the almighty God. Yes. You've set us on a purpose in this earth, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank, thank you for your word. Thank you for your people. Thank you for your son. Yes, Lord. Jesus' thank name. You. Amen. Tonight we're going to title the message, Finished My Course, which is from something that Paul said that we'll get into a little bit later here. So I want to talk a little about Paul first. And, you know, when you look at Paul, John the Baptist, King David, a lot of the people that God used, because they have flaws, if you will, or they did something they shouldn't have, people a lot of times kind of make light of them. So, well, you know, they'd be an overcomer if they didn't do that. Well, you know what? That's true. <laughs> because by definition, an overcomer overcomes. Now, because, because there are certain things that you had a good report, but you went on to be with the Lord. Some of that, it, 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 you don't criticize the life of the person that, that God trusted to write so much of the Word of God. I mean, it's the Lord. The reason we know these people is because the Lord used them, and he used them, they being dead, yet speaketh. He used them, and then that, he's still using them, and he's using them in our lives. So, I've heard it said that, you know, Paul didn't have to die, he was just stubborn. And so, he was, went down to Jerusalem when he shouldn't have. Well, you know, there's a couple sides to this. First of all, when you say Paul was stubborn, look at, look what he had to contend with. He did things that would have melted another person. He faced situations that other people would have gone screaming into the night. And not only did he stand, he went forward. Because he stubbornly held fast to the word of God, stubbornly held to the course that God had set him on. Now, does that mean that, that if the Lord speaks something to you, you should go, no, I don't think I want to do that. No, that would be not what you want to do. But I'm saying the, that what people talk about, boy, if he just wasn't stubborn, you know what, if he hadn't been stubborn, we wouldn't have what's written out here in the book. And because it took a man who would go through things. It would took a man who would stand up, have a whole city come against him, and keep going forward. Um, it's, it's part of his character. Let's look what it says um, in uh, Acts 14, 19. This is the time Paul was ministering in Lystra. And there came thither, 14, Acts 14, 19, there came thither certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium, where he'd been before, and they stirred up the people. They persuaded the people. And having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city, supposing he'd been dead. I mean, this city turned against Paul. What did Paul do? He was just preaching the gospel. Way back when he first started preaching the gospel, after his conversion in Damascus, he preached and they listened. They said, wasn't this the one who was persecuting the church? Now he's preaching the same thing he used to persecute. And it says they took counsel together to kill him. Paul started off with not just a little, uh, not just somebody rolling their eyes at him, not just somebody not inviting him to dinner because of who he was, not somebody who said, oh, that Christian. Paul had people wanting to kill him from almost the very moment he got saved. So they drew Paul out of the city supposing he'd been dead. However, as the disciples stood round about him, he rose up and came into the city and the next day departed with Barnabas to Derby. 
So think of this. See, I mean, he was stoned and left for dead. Can you imagine how horrible a stoning is? People picking up rocks and throwing them at you as hard as they can, breaking bones. I mean, they just, whatever happened to him, they thought he was dead from all of this. Dragged him out of the city. The disciples stood around, and I'm sure they were praying, and he got up, went back in the city. So did he say, you know, I'm turning it in. I'm not going to go through this again. No, he went and preached in the next city. Left right away to go preach again. He departed with Barnabas to Derby. That's, that is the kind of, let's call it stubbornness because we want to make a point, but that's the kind of tenacity, endurance that this man of God had. And he faced this not just once, not just twice. He faced it for years and years and years. Most, most people have looked into it, and this goes back to the usual disclaimer. When you go back and look at dates of things, you know, Luke was really good. He, 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 he gave us a way to about nail the date of a couple of things. So-and-so was the Pontia, he was, you know, the Pret King, and all. He, he put enough stuff together we could do it. But when he comes over the book of Acts, you don't get that. And so there's, there's variation in anything you do, but it, uh, if, it appears Paul was about 60 years old when he died, right around there. And that was in the 80s, 60-something. So that means that Paul here, because he was a young man when he put his garments, at the, at the, when Stephen was being stoned, Paul went decade after decade facing this stuff. And he just kept going. And God, now, you know, somebody once said that before people criticize me for how I manage my healing ministry, let them go around the world and heal hundreds and hundreds in every city. And it's kind of like, before you get too critical of this man, Read what he did and see if you'd stand up to it. Or would you crawl under the blanket and say, I'm, <laughs> this isn't for me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sit behind my screen at the internet, read the Bible, pray a little. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to become a modern monk, sealed off from everything because I don't want to deal with this. Well, this man dealt with it, and he didn't dealt with it at arm's length. He went right in the middle of it. Even when he got down to Jerusalem where they said bonds awaited him and he said, well, I'm committed to go there. It says in Acts 21, 27, he was there, he was in the temple and, um, and they were on a, a kind of a, a fast. And when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews which were of Asia, now look at this. These are the same type of guys that came down and stirred up Lystra against Paul. See, these guys followed him around and they caused him no end of opposition. Which were of Asia, when they saw him in the temple, stirred up all the people. Now, one thing they do appear to be good at is stirring up the people. And they laid hands on Paul. And they cried out, men of Israel, help! This is the man that teaches all men everywhere against the people and the law and this place. And further, he's brought Greeks into the temple and polluted this holy place. For they had seen before, they had seen him in the city with Trophimus and Ephesian, whom they supposed Paul had brought into the temple. So this, is all, this isn't even based on fact. This is based on what they thought might have happened and their ability to stir everybody up with their narrative. And they did. They laid hands on Paul. And it says in Acts 21.30, And all the city was moved. And the people ran together. And they took Paul and they drew him out of the temple. And the doors were shut. They weren't going to let him back in. They pulled him out of the temple. And as they went about to kill him, as they went about to kill him, here it is again, this man 
He, when he says he stood in jeopardy of his life over and over again, just these few things we're reading, they, they all wanted to kill him. One time they thought, in Lystra, they thought they did and dragged him out of the city. And as they went about to kill Paul, tidings came to the chief captain of the band that all Jerusalem was in an uproar. Now remember, this is the capital city, and they have some sort of law and order there. And these guys heard there was an uproar. And if you were, um, if you were part of the Roman government, you did not want an uproar in the areas you were charged with. So he, the captain heard about this, and he immediately took soldiers and centurions and ran down to them. And when they saw the chief captain and the soldiers, they left beating Paul. So what were they doing? They went out to kill him. They were beating him. And when the captain came upon the stairs, it was so... Hang on, let me back that up. And when he came upon the stairs, so it was that he was born of the soldiers for the violence of the people. The soul, that mean when Paul got, they started taking him up the stairs because of the violence of the people, they had to carry him to get him out of there. He was born of soldiers for the violence of the people, for the multitude of the people followed after, crying, away with him, away with him. But Paul got upstairs a little, said, I'm a man which am a Jew of Tarsus, because they thought he was someone else, a city in Cilicia, a citizen of no mean city. I beseech thee, suffer me to speak to the people. Here's, here's, this is Paul. This is, we'll call it stubbornness for the purpose of understanding something here. This is a man who didn't run from trouble, he turned around and faced it because he wanted to help people. This is how much love was in his heart for mankind. He knew what he had. He knew who he represented. He knew what the gospel could do. And he said, let me talk to him. They just tried to kill him. They had to pull him out of there. They'd been, these people had been beating him. And he didn't turn around and say, okay, now you guys are in trouble. He turned around to preach the gospel. So this was who, this was who Paul was. And the reason we want to look at this is because of some of the things he said that we're going to look at here tonight. And Paul did something else. Something that based on my experience, not trying to be critical, but based on my experience, very few other people could go forward if they were in Paul's shoes. First of all, very few other people would stand up year after year, city after city, to what Paul was in. They'd say, Lord, I thought I was just going to be an evangelist. I'd come in, do a big meeting, everybody loved me, and then I'd get out of there and let the pastors mop it up. Paul would go in, and they'd cause an uproar, and the whole city would be stirred up against him. Time after time after time. And you know what? He didn't go, oh, I'm out of the will of God. He just, remember, we read in other places, he besought the Lord several times to have this pass, this thorn in the flesh, these Judaizers pass from him. The Lord said, my grace is sufficient for you. I've got something for you. Now you can overcome this. You can rise above it, and you can convert. You, you can show the love of God, just like Jesus did when they nailed him to the cross. So, but here's something else that Paul did. And it'll make sense in a minute. Let me read to you who Saul was, which was Paul before he was converted was called Saul. First of all, in Acts 8.1, Saul was consenting to Stephen's death. So Saul was there at the first Christian martyr when Stephen was put to death by the Sanhedrin. In Acts 8.3, and as for Saul, he made havoc of the church. Saul said to himself, I'm very jealous in the Jews' religion. He made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women and committed them to prison. Now, you don't want to go to a Roman prison in the old days. Not a good place. 
And he's, high, he's, he's grabbing men and women and committing them to prison. That's, that's when he says he wrought havoc, that's the kind of, of trouble that he was, he was in the church. And then he got letters from the high priest to go to Damascus and grab any people over that way and bring them back bound to Jerusalem. It says in Acts 9 and verse 1, And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter, that word means slaughter, it means murder, just so you're really clear. So Paul, or Saul, yet breathing out threatenings, but not just threatenings, he was breathing out slaughter, murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. So here's a man that was so incensed against this, what he thought was a false religion that was defiling the way of the fathers, that he he wrecked havoc in the churches. He arrested people, men and women, thinking he did God a service, by the way. And it says in verse 3, And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth, and he heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And Saul said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you persecute. It's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. That's the pricks of his heart. And Paul, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what will you have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Rise, go into the city, and it will be told thee what you must do. Now, as an aside here, there are many, many Christians, because I've, 50 years of being with the Lord, I've encountered many, many Christians who in that situation would have been praying that God would destroy that man, that he'd kill him, that he'd bring judgment on him. Well, he did kind of bring a judgment on him. He came face to face with the judge. And he said, he said, what do you have me do? And he said, you go in the city and a man is going to come to thee and tell thee what to do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice but seeing no man. And Saul rose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he didn't see anybody. He was blinded. But they led him by the hand and brought him to Damascus. Now there's three times in the book of Acts that Paul gives his testimony, which you can see just like we've, we've taught, our testimony is the most powerful thing we have to touch people's hearts for the Lord because that's how we got touched. Mm -hmm. So I'm, gonna, I'm just going to touch on the other two times Paul tells the same story. And if we go over to Acts 9, well, for, I guess we'll finish this one first. And so Paul sends a disciple and, and the disciple goes, wait a minute, I've heard about this guy. He's arresting people. He's hauling them to jail. And the Lord said unto, unto him, you go your way. He's a chosen vessel to me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. I'm going to show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Now, this word says he must suffer. That actually translates just simply as experience. I'll show him how great things he must experience for my name's sake. The word's pathos, out of which, which is one of the things in Greek plays and things, there's pathos to them. Something that brings strong feeling and emotion. So Paul is going to experience great things that bring strong feelings of emotion for his Jesus namesake. Some are good, some not so good. So we talked earlier how he was carried up the stairs. When he got to turn around and speak to everybody, 
This is what he said, Acts 22, 6. And it came to pass, Paul said on these stairs after they tried, after they were beating him, that I made my journey and was come near to Damascus about noon. Now, a couple of things. He's coming near to Damascus. It's noon, which typically is when the sun's highest overhead. So it's bright daylight. There's no, no, sh this isn't like one of, uh, of, of the plays of the old people where there's dark shadowy things and it's bright, it's about as bright during the day as it gets. And it's about noon, which is one of the hours of prayers of the Jews. And suddenly there shone from heaven a great light round about. Here he is, it, I mean, he's got that bright sun at noon and something brighter than that shines all around. And I fell to the ground. And I heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Same thing we'd, we already read from the first account. Now let's look at the third one. So in this, it's, in this, it's a bright light. There in the first one he read, the people heard a verse, voice, but they didn't see anybody. Now, now when he stands before Agrippa, he gives his testimony again. At midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven about the brightness of the sun shining round about me and them which journeyed with me. And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking to me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecute thou me? But rise, and then he goes on in verse 16, but rise, stand upon your feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose. The Lord said, he said, Paul, I've appeared to you for a purpose, to make you a minister and a witness, both of these things that you have seen and of those things in which I will appear to you. Mm -hmm. Delivering you from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom I now send thee. So the Lord said, I'm going to appear to you. I'm going to deliver you from the people and from the Gentiles of whom I now send thee. He said, but I have appeared to you for a purpose. To make you a witness and a minister of Jesus Christ. This is the man who's killing the church. And now the Lord's appeared to him, and he says, I have a purpose for you, Saul. Now remember when I said, well, okay, let me do a, let me finish that up first. D delivering him and from the Gentiles, whom I now send thee, verse 18, to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among them which are sanctified by the faith that is in me. Paul, here's your mission. Here's your purpose. This is what's laid out for you. Now, here's a, this is a, just kind of an aside. But in these three accounts, which are the only three accounts of this, did anybody notice there's no animals? Paul wasn't riding a horse and fell off the horse. Yep, yep. He wasn't riding a donkey and fell off the donkey. Matter of fact, everybody fell up to the ground. Now, where did people get this idea? Because I was, I was preaching the other a while ago. I don't remember how long ago. And I started to say something about the light appearing to Paul and he fell. And I almost said, off his donkey. And I thought, whoa, there wasn't one. Why? Well, how has that gotten so ingrained? It's cause, well, how's it in all the little Bible books and then things you get? Because, because the artists back in like the 1600s, there's two really famous paintings where Paul fell off his, where Paul fell off his horse when he was converted. Um, I don't remember the guy's name, it starts with the C, but this is around the 1600s and of course much Catholicism behind all of this. 
because they have their own book of golden of the golden rule which is all the legends and stuff that goes along with this so who knows how they got there but once those paintings became famous now everybody thinks that Paul fell off his donkey now this is happens all the time in the word I've talked to you before about how I saw that movie the Ten Commandments when I was a kid and until for years and years and years as a Christian who read the Bible and that was actually I read that at the area of the Bible all the time I loved it and then one day I finally read it and it said and and the sun rose over the sea that had closed in on Pharaoh and everybody and I thought wait a minute this was a night crossing and the Ten Commandments was a day crossing and I thought okay that's that's what happens when you get your your uh, understanding scripture from movies and pictures so I'll, I will only that's an aside and the reason for it is simply this who knows what else is out there who knows how many other little things in those children's Bible books we all saw and were raised up in or Sunday school stories we were told you've got to go back here this is what you trust yes now let's go back to what we're actually talking about which was Paul and his stubbornness that let him go forward in an environment that would crush most people but what we just read here I think is the fact that he overcame what we just read is I think as great a testament to his ability to go forward as we could look for because most people that had killed Christians that had hated the church and they and then they came to the Lord and realized what they'd done they'd be crushed under a weight of guilt and shame that would have paralyzed them they wouldn't be going out and doing what Paul was doing they'd want to they'd want to lash themselves and walk upstairs on their knees or something some sort of a penance for everything they'd done Paul got forgiven and the weight of guilt was cast off and you you can hear that when you read in his epistles as you read them Paul wrote most of the New Testament so he was able to be totally free from Saul became Paul a new creation in Christ Jesus and he understood what that meant now do you think for a minute that he never had to struggle with that that the enemy didn't come up and say hey you're a Christian killer what are you even doing talking about Jesus you ought to go hide somewhere because that's what he says to everybody else why would he leave Paul alone who's about to do his kingdom great damage and but people how many people have we known do you know throughout the years that have struggled under a, a weight of guilt and shame because they couldn't let go they couldn't believe in the forgiveness and love that God had for them and so they kept wanting to go back and forth and wallow in something that God had sent his son to die for shed his blood for and bear on the cross so we wouldn't have to bear this man under I can't imagine hardly a bigger weight that he, somebody could come into the kingdom with he did it and he was turned around and he went forth and he helped others he said I've labored more than they all because of the grace given to me he knew what God had done for him he knew how much darkness was in his life till the light came and he brought he went forth with that knowledge and he consistently did it he was faithful and now he comes toward the end Paul has been been working he started churches in all these cities he's strengthened elders and set them in and strengthened them in all these cities he's worked closely with people like Timothy and Titus and now in 2 Timothy 4 1 mm -hmm. Paul is speaking to Timothy and he says I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who will judge the quick the living and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom 
preach the word. Be instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. The reason I read you that background is so when you read this, you can think of who's saying it. Preach the word. What did he say to the Ephesian elders who were crying because they wouldn't see him anymore? He said, I commend you to God and the word of his grace. Preach the word. For the time will come, verse 3, they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts they will heap themselves teachers, having itching ears. And they'll turn away their ears from the truth and be turned to fables. But Timothy, watch thou in all things. Endure afflictions. Think he had an example of that in Paul? Do the work of an evangelist. Paul was always sharing Jesus Christ. Make full proof of your ministry. Now there's nobody that's a Christian that doesn't have a ministry. We are all been given the ministry of reconciliation. We have all been given the opportunity. We have been given the authority to become the sons of God. We have a ministry. Ministry just means to serve. We're to serve. We're God's children. We're to serve mankind. He said, make full proof of your ministry. Don't wait. Don't see. That's why God hates the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, that there's a clergy and a laity. He, he hates that people think they can pay a professional preachers and ministers to do what they ought to be doing. We're all professional teachers and ministers. We're all full-time Christians. Yes. I've had a lot of phases in my life. I've worked full-time and I preached and started churches, etc. And I've had times where, short times, where I could even just be a full-time preacher. That was good. I liked that. But both of them are good because I've always been a full-time Christian. And every one of us is a full-time Christian. Amen. God doesn't hire, hire part-timers. You're all, either all in or you're probably not in. So, make full proof of your ministry. Now, this is what, this is, this man now has come to this point in his life. He's older. Paul the Aged, he calls himself. He's had plenty of time to reflect. He's had He's done things that nobody's ever done. He's brought the gospel to the ends of the earth at that time. And now listen what he says to Timothy. He said, Timothy, I, you need to do all these things for I am now ready to be offered. He wasn't ready to be offered earlier when he said, which way to go, I don't, don't know yet. Should I choose to stay with you or should I choose to go on? But here he says, now I'm ready to be offered, poured out, like a drink offering, which is when there's sacrifices, that's the last thing poured out. And he said, and the time of my departure is at hand. So this man of God, who's done so much, who is so relentless that he turns around, wants to go back and face the people that have persecuted him with the gospel, he says, all right, I'm ready now. I tell you what, I was reading that a, a little while ago, and I just, tears came to my eyes. I could hardly talk to think that here, I mean, imagine Paul, been in prison, he's been to all these things, he knows all these people, some have left him, some have followed with him. He's experienced, well, Jesus said you're going to experience great things. He's experienced all sorts of things. And now he says, okay, I'm ready. How can he say now that I'm ready? There's still people to be saved. Verse uh, 4-7. He says, Timothy, I have fought a good fight. Kind of like that song we sang tonight. Fighting that good fight of faith. And, and, and this is 2 Timothy 4, 7. In 1 Timothy 6, 12, you know what he tells Timothy? He says, fight the good fight of faith. 
Here he says, I have fought a good fight. You've seen how I've lived. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto you are also called, and have professed a good profession before many witnesses. So I have, he, I mean, he's just testifying now. So I'm ready. I fought the good fight. I'm not going to fight the good fight. I'm not regretful of the time I've spent. I have fought a good fight. Then he says this, I have finished my course. This is why he's ready. So the time of my departure is at hand. I've, I've finished my course. Now others are going to take over. I've finished. Now Paul is the one who talks about the Christian life is like running a race. Every race, when you think about it, has a course. You don't just aim people and they just spread out in every direction running as fast as they can. There's a course. If it's a marathon, it could be uphill, downhill, across rivers, but it's a specific course and if they want to win, they need to stay on course. And that is exactly what he is saying to us. If you want to win, stay on course. Fight the good fight. Lay hold of eternal life. Do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of your ministry. Now, Timothy's younger. He's saying, Timothy, I've, I've done all this. I'm ready. He says, I have finished my course. How many can say, as they get older, they come to the point, how many can really say, I've finished my course. Based on what I hear talking to people, most people don't even know what their course is, even though they've been Christians for years. So how could they know if they finished it if they don't even know if they've started? I mean, you don't accidentally win a race. It's, you go and you follow the trail and you keep on. And if it gets hard, you keep on. If you get tired, you keep on. You just keep pushing forward. Yes. And the first one over the finish line wins the race. Jesus said in John 4.34, Jesus said to them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me, and what? To finish his work. Jesus said it is finished. Jesus finished his course. He had a work to do. And he finished it. You say, how could he have finished it? There were still... People to be discipled and work to do. Yep, yeah, but he finished his part. His earth, when he was here on this earth, he finished what he was to do. And then he could, into thy hands I commit my spirit. Acts 13, 25, John the Baptist. And as John fulfilled his course, Paul said, I finished my course. Here it says, as John the Baptist fulfilled his course. People criticize John. Oh, well, he got some doubt when he was in prison. Well, guess what? It says here he fulfilled his course. <laughs> and again I say, how many can say they fulfilled their course? How many could even tell you what their course is? Yes. That they are laboring with all heart to fulfill. John fulfilled his course. And as John fulfilled his course, he said... Who do you think that I am? I'm not, I'm not him. But behold, there comes one after me whose shoes of his feet I'm not worthy to loose. John came as the, as the proclaimer of Christ to prepare the way of the Lord. He finished his course. It says in 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 24, Don't you know that they which run in a race all run but one receives the prize. You see some of these big marathon races, sometimes they have hundreds, and sometimes it looks like thousands of people, and they all have to run a course. But still, the first one across the finish line wins. It's not who starts the race, it's who finishes it. You know, a lot of Christians, all they want to do is talk about starting the race. Oh yeah, I remember when I went down to the altar, and then the Lord touched my life. And then they come back every Sunday 
to remember that. And that's all because all during the week, they haven't been living for the Lord. And they feel the weight of guilt. And so they got to come back and get reminded of the love of God and the forgiveness of God. And then they go do it. It just becomes a vicious cycle that doesn't finish a course. It's running without knowing where you're going. And every, it says, don't you know they which run in a race run all, but one receives the prize. So run that you may obtain. So, well, we shouldn't want to be the first. Well, I, Paul says that you're running a race. Yes. You don't have any choice. You got saved. You got in a race. Yes. You got saved. You got in a warfare. You got saved. You got a part of something a lot bigger than you, the kingdom. Yes. And so, run that you may obtain since you're in this thing. Yes. Win. Yes. Go for it. Yes. And by the way, there's more than one winner in this race. You know, because God is, God is just so good. Every man, verse 25, that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. So all of these, you know, the, the Greeks started these big athletic games and when they won the games, they'd kind of put a little wreath on their head, a crown. And Paul says they do it to obtain a corruptible crown. That thing will decay and fade away. A hundred years from now, probably won't even be able to find it. It'll be decayed. But we get an incorruptible crown. We get something made of gold tried in the fire. We get something that is made by the hand of God and given to us as the victor's reward. It says in verse 26, Paul says, I therefore so run, not as uncertainly. I don't run and not know where I'm going. Look at if you don't know where you're going, I suggest you take the map, the word of God, sit down with it, find out where you are, where you're going, and get going. Why would you want to spend your whole life going the wrong way or going on a sidetrack when the Bible is given to us so we could finish our own course. Yes. Yes. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly. I fight, but not like somebody that beats the air. You know, they're just punching at the air and hoping he hits something. He fights certainly. He knows how to hit. And what does it take to hit? The Word of God. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And he says in verse 27, but I keep my body and I bring it into subjection. Lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I should be a castaway. Paul says, I don't want to preach to others and then not make it myself. What, is, what are we talking about? Finishing your course, knowing what your course is and finishing it. Fighting a good fight. Laying hold of eternal life. It says in Hebrews 12, 1, Wherefore, seeing we are also compassed about with such a great cloud of witnesses, let's lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. And what? Let's run with patience the race that is set before us. The Lord said, Paul, I've made you a witness and a minister. I've set a course before you. Show you what great things you must experience. He's done that. Look, he has great things set before all of us if we will run the race. But if we're busy, yeah, if you never leave the house, how are you going to run a race? That was the monastery approach they used back in the, in the dark ages. And it produced nothing. So great a cloud of witnesses. Let's lay aside every weight. And run with patience the race set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. So Paul said, I finished my course. I mean, here he is. Timothy, look, I've run this race. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. And then he says, I have kept the faith. 
back there in uh, 2 Timothy 4 again. I have fought a good fight. I finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me. Now, here's Paul again. He, he's come to the end. Finished his course. Departure time is near. He tells Timothy, he's trying to get Timothy, hey, follow in these footsteps. Because henceforth there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but also unto all them that love is appearing. So, many times when you run a race, when you get to the end, your crown isn't sitting there and you just grab it and put it on your head. There's like an award ceremony. So what is Paul saying here? Do you notice what he says? He says, there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness. He doesn't say he has it. He doesn't say just when he departs his body, he's going to receive it. He said, there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness that the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me when? At that day. And not me only, but unto all them that love his appearing. When he appears, that's when he is going to hand out the crowns. But Paul, he said, look, I fought a good fight. I've endured. I've finished my course. There is laid up for me a crown. I know. I've got a crown. And I'm, I am just looking forward to that day when Jesus appears and he sets it upon my head. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. And when you go to Revelation 3.11, very interesting scripture. And here, here you could, you could sidetrack into a whole nother message or two. But it says, Jesus says, Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast that you have, that no man take your crown. Paul said, I've, I've laid up a crown. Jesus says, well then, and he said, I have fought the good fight. I have kept the faith. I've held fast. There is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. What, what it says here in Revelation 3, Jesus says, I come quickly. Hold fast what you have. Why? That no man take your crown. The enemy uses men. That no man defraud you of your crown. Take your crown. You see, if the Lord's laid up for this crown, how can somebody else take it? Because they can get you to go the wrong direction. Instead of attending on the Lord without distraction, you're doing nothing but being distracted and not attending upon the Lord. You aren't finishing your course. My meat, Jesus said, is to finish my Father's work. Is that our meat? Is that our desire? And do we know what that is for us? Well, it's all laid out in the roadmap, the Word of God. And God wants His people to receive crowns. I mean, Jesus, when He comes back, well, that, like I said, we could go into whole different messages here. But God wants us, we are laying up crowns, we are laying up rewards, and when He comes, He wants to be able to hand those out. But isn't that interesting? Because when you understand that you can lay it up, but it doesn't get handed out until Jesus returns, then it makes a lot of sense when he says that no man take your crown. Because until you depart, until you're ready to be offered, until you can say, I finished my course, and so you say, I fought the good fight, I've kept the faith, Revelation 3.11, hold fast that no man take your crown. And that's what we're going to do because that's what, that's what this message we've heard preaches. To him that overcometh, he's going to get a crown. But you've got to overcome. And you've got to know what to overcome. And you've got to know where you're going. And all of that isn't at all complicated because it's right here. And it's been preached. And for most of us, we've heard this, Mount Zion with the Lamb, for a half a century. So, I hope we've fought a good fight. 
I hope we've fulfilled our course, or are fulfilling our course. Like he told Timothy, I hope we're making full proof of our ministry. Whatever that is, that we're doing what God wants us to do in our lives. And by the way, it won't be, um, it won't be everybody's going this way for the race and you're going that way. That's what God wants you to do. Uh -uh. It'll, we're all going to be going this way. Some might uh, go faster or slower. Some might do some things better than others. Like there's people that go down to cities and they convert drunks and drug users and prostitutes and, and they bring them to the Lord and they get them cleaned up. Well, I don't happen to go into areas where there's all that. So I'm very thankful for the people in the body that do that. That's their course. But I have other things that I do that they can't do because it, it requires ministering in a different, to a different congregation, if you will. So thank you, Lord. As you can see, you could, you could just keep going with this. Those, that, that, those three things that Paul says, those are powerful. And to keep those three things and to be able to say, I've fought the good fight, not I'm going to, I have. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. I've done it. Now, all that's left is for me to receive the crown when he appears. And I love his appearing. And I'm ready to be honored.